what are we going to be talking about today? Well, first, the name of the webinar is how to prepare for a cookie list feature. So naturally, we think a good place to start is to speak about what is the cookie list feature in the first place. We're then going to talk a little bit about zero party data, why you should care about it, and how Typeform can help you there. And we're going to end the presentation with some best practices that we've seen over our years of data collection before we launch into the Q&A. And just a quick introduction of who will be presenting from the Typeform team. My name is Nina Kamarudin, and I am a senior product marketing manager here at Typeform. I've worked a lot with market and customer research, helping run um, various studies to learn about our target customers, uh, as well as to validate messaging strategies. And I would say that I know personally, firsthand, the value of zero party data. And hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Branscombe, uh, Senior Director of Brand Marketing here at Typeform. And I've been a marketer in various roles for over 10 years in both B2C and B2B all of which rely on cookies. So with that said, I think we can jump right in. So what is the cookie list feature and what are some of the challenges it presents? Before we talk about what it is, I thought it would be helpful to give a high level refresher about the types of cookies we're dealing with because not all of them are at risk. Generally speaking, we have first party cookies and third party cookies not to be confused with first party and third party data, which we will be talking about later. First party cookies are those placed by the website a user is directly visiting, and they're used to improve the consumer user experience by remembering things like logins, preferences, and other settings. So kind of like when you're shopping and you go back to your cart, your cart is still there. Third party cookies are cookies placed by websites other than the one a user is currently visiting, often for things like cross-site tracking, advertising, analytics. And these are the ones that we're talking about when we're referring to a cookie list feature. You're probably familiar with how they work, even if you don't know the, the backend developer side of things. So imagine you're shopping online for shoes on one website, and then you start seeing ads for those exact shoes or maybe that brand on different websites and or social media platforms. This is because a third-party cookie has been tracking your browsing behavior to target you with relevant ads throughout your web experience. So again, it's important to remember that a cookie list feature is really just a third-party cookie list feature. If your cart is full at Zara.com, like I said, you don't have to worry about when you get back to it. It'll still be there. You can still check out. You're good to go. But there's a reason this is happening. First, 40% of Americans don't believe companies ethically use the data they have on them. Second, 86% say that the data, pri that data privacy is a growing concern for them personally. But the head scratcher here is that 71% of these consumers expect brands to personalize their experience, be that on websites and emails and advertising and so much more. This is what we call the privacy personalization paradox. Try saying that 10 times fast. Yes, first party cookies can still service some of these basic personalization needs, like I mentioned with the logins and the carts, but third party cookies made it even better, in quotes, and let brands show you what they think you want to see all across the web and on your social media platforms, almost following you around. Many people consider this creepy, but we've been doing it since the late 90s, early 2000s, pretty much since the dawn of the internet, and businesses have relied on these third party cookies to frankly generate revenue. So I buried the lead a little bit here. We said we're going to talk about what the cookie list feature is, but I put it at the end because I wanted to set that context. But what are what's some of the latest information on the cookie list feature? A few months ago, I believe it was, yeah, it was January 4th. After years of pushing back the timeline, Google officially started deprecating 1% of third-party cookies with a plan to ramp up to 100% by the end of the year. That's a very expedited timeline considering this has been talked about for years and years and years now. Meanwhile, 75% of marketers still rely on them, spending nearly half of their budgets on campaigns and tactics that entirely are predicated on using third-party cookies. So it's understandable why 16% say they worry a cookie list future will be devastating for their business. And frankly, I'm surprised it's not more. But there are solutions, and that is where we get to zero-party data. So here we'll talk about what that is and why we should care about it. 
So there are four main types of customer data businesses can collect and use. There's a little bit of crossover for each, so bear with me. But starting with zero-party data, this is data that a customer in intentionally and proactively shares with a brand, typically because they asked, like filling out a preferences form on a shopping website to receive personalized and recommend personalized recommendations and styling tips. As you can tell, I have a background in the kind of the fashion retail space. So a lot of my analogies relate to that as it relates to cookies. First party data is next. And this is data collected directly from your audience or customer through interactions with your business. So it's more based on observations versus direct conversations. So for example, Spotify, you're all probably familiar with the music service. Uh, they're tracking what you listen to, so they can recommend new music, new artists, or maybe suggest playlists according to your perceived tastes or what they assume your tastes are because of what you're listening to. Second party data is essentially just another company's first party data that you acquire directly from them, often through some sort of partnership. So this, again, for a retail analogy, this is like two clothing stores agreeing to share their customer purchase data with each other to expand their understanding of general customer preferences. Last is third-party data, not to be confused directly with third-party cookies, even though there is some relation, but this is data collected and more often than not bought by a business that doesn't have a direct relationship with the user it's about. So typically it's bought in large quantities, but therefore the quality can suffer and it's often done without super clear consent from the user that the data is actually about. As you can kind of see, as you move from zero to third-party data, you might be getting more quantity but the quality is lower and it's also not being shared by the people that it's about. Therefore, the consent and the privacy concerns come into place. This is really the main concern for the growing privacy concerns that I mentioned before, hence why we're focusing on zero party data, which essentially is just a subset of first party data and something you might be noticing as a more buzzy, more recent term, in the, especially as marketers. So, it's endlessly valuable. And again, it's been around for a long time. It's literally just getting information from people, but they're, it's valuable for so many parts of business and marketing. And I wanted to highlight just a few key types, even though there's loads and loads and loads more. So contact information, pretty obvious here, name, email, phone name, number. This is the information you typically need for most marketing and sales tactics. It's the information you would send to a CRM or to an email service provider. It's also highly useful for personalization. Voice of the customer data, this really refers to all data that a business gathers from people through social media comments, reviews, chatbots, survey responses, so on and so forth. Testimonials, doesn't need much explanation, it's a little more self-explanatory. And finally, feedback. So this could technically be bucketed in voice of the customer, but it's worth calling out separately. Brands can and should ask for feedback on their product, their service, their pricing, their marketing, their content, or whatever they deem valuable to get feedback on. And again, like I said, zero party data might sound like some new buzzword, but it's always been around. It's just become increasingly relevant as consumers become more and more concerned with privacy and trust, kind of going back to those statistics that I mentioned in the beginning. But the method by which zero party data is collected in and of itself establishes trust through things like forms, quizzes, and surveys, because the user is voluntarily filling these things out, hitting submit, giving you the information. This is assuming, of course, that you as a business or as a marketer are not selling that information or sharing it with other, other businesses or platforms without their consent. And we use zero-party zero party data to personalize website and marketing experiences, so we're able to mitigate some of the concerns surrounding privacy and trust that third-party cookies tends to create. So to wrap up this overview a bit, we like to think of zero-party data as a win-win so solution. It's shared willingly. You ask, they answer. It's accurate because it's coming directly from the source. It builds trust and sidesteps most of the privacy concerns, emphasis on most. It allows you to create that personalized experience that 71% of people and consumers expect to see. So in short, as a business, you can deliver both privacy and personalization, circumventing that privacy personalization paradox. I now I've said it correctly twice, which is great. Um, but now I'll pass it back to Nina to discuss in a little more detail how you can collect zero party data and use it for business, for marketing, what have you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kevin.
So now that we know that collecting zero party data is a win-win situation, how do we actually go about collecting it and using it? So the first step of this journey is to engage directly with your customers. And this can be done in a few different ways, such as having your customers fill out a form. For example, data collected in a sign-up form or a lead capture form captures uh, essential customer data that you can use for personalized outreach and campaigns. You could also have your customers participate in a survey, which would offer insights into their preferences, behaviors, needs, pain points, and things like that. Or you could even have your customers complete an online quiz, sorry, <laughs> like a product recommendation quiz or an assessment quiz. Not only are quizzes fun and engaging, they can also give you insights into your customers' preferences and interests, enabling targeted marketing campaigns in the future. And once that first step is complete, you can then enrich your collected data with data from additional third-party sources. And this can be data like company size, industry, revenue, and more. And enriching customer uh, data enables you to do a couple of things, such as building much more complete, deep um, customer profiles that you can feed into your CRM, um, like, like a HubSpot or a MailChimp. Um, with additional data points that you now have and a more holistic view of your customer, you can also then better qualify and score any leads that you might come in and build a deeper understanding of your customer than you had before. And once you have all of this rich data about your customer, you can use that data to power more personalized customer experiences across your marketing funnel. Um, for example, you can use that data you've collected to help you more accurately segment your leads or customers based on real user data and how they respond and send them to the right channel. Uh, you could also ensure that you show them the most relevant content, for example, like product recommendations based on their personal preferences to save them time and bring them closer to purchase. So as you can see in the picture in this example, uh, based on hair type, you can then decide what sort of product you would want to recommend. And remember, these personalized touches, they are important. So as a callback to um, an earlier stat that Kevin shared, like 71% of customers expect brands to personalize their experience now. And this is only possible if you have the right data. But zero party data isn't just about collecting data just for the sake of it. It's also about uh, gathering meaningful insights. So for example, you can use zero party data to validate and refine your marketing strategy. Um, by sending out surveys to your customer or market panel, you can, for example, take a pulse check on your understanding of the market and your target audience. You could also see if your marketing strategy resonates and makes sense and fine tune it for maximum impact. Or you can even see if the messaging is landing with your target audience and use that data to refine messaging based on real customer feedback. Um, and in a similar vein, you can uh, take advantage of zero party data by leveraging customer feedback to identify different areas for improvement in your products or services, and then funnel those insights to the relevant teams in your organization who can action on that feedback and address customer pain points and continue to improve your business's offering. Now, after that little appetizer, a little intro to how zero party data can be used, comes the question, how can Type from help? Well, with over a decade of experience in this space, our mission here at Typeform is really to help businesses get the data they need with forms that people actually enjoy and respond to. But don't just take my word for it. Um, here are some recent internal studies that we've run that have shown that 82% of customers uh, report that using Typeform has helped them collect better zero party data um, and thus help them gain valuable insights directly from their customers and their audience without relying on third party cookies. Uh, we also have seen that Typeform um, can boost completion rates up to 26%. And with more personalized and engaging forms, respondents are more likely to respond to and complete your forms, ultimately leading to more and better data. 
And finally, 93% of customers attest to the fact that Typeform has improved their customer experience. So by offering a seamless, enjoyable on-brand experience, not only can you collect data, but you can build stronger relationships with your customers and hopefully drive loyalty too. And we also have some great examples of how some amazing real-life customers have used Typeform. Um, this is Climate Hero, which is a subscription-based carbon footprint reduction solution. One thing that they've done is built a quiz that calculates people's carbon footprint and how to catch uh, and captures contact information that has been embedded on their website. Uh, the data that Climate Hero collects via Typeform is then pushed to their marketing automation tool where personalized content funnels are triggered based on how people responded to their forms. Um, they have recently celebrated a really impressive milestone, which is 1 million Typeform submissions, with people pledging to reduce their carbon footprint by 2 million tons total per year. And this is really impressive considering that the Climate Hero business is completely bootstrapped and has ex been experienced 80% year on year growth with profitability. Another interesting customer is API Sec University, which is an online platform offering a wide selection of API security courses and resources. They have seen an 80% completion rate on course feedback surveys, which is uh, a great number. And although this is a huge volume of data that they're given, Typeform's detailed summary review has made it easy for them to analyze and pick out insights from the data. And the success of these feedback surveys has also led them to explore different use cases for Typeform to collect zero party data, such as market research, as well as um, workshop request forms for the clients who want them. And finally, there's SparkToro, which is an audience research tool that has used Typeform to survey over 14,000 potential users and validate its product market fit. Um, instead of just asking the normal name and role questions, they ask questions that provided deeper insights, like what type of problem did you hope to, do you hope to solve, or how do you figure out what website your audience visits? So all of this deep dive data was collected. That was collected was automatically sent uh, to Google Sheets via an integration, where they were able to organize the answers and create sample sets for different cohorts. And in the words of Rand Fishkin, the founder of SparkToro, the data that they've collected has helped them really get to the core of what product uh, they should be building. So three different customers and some really, really great results. And if you're getting interested in getting results like Climate Hero, API Sec, or SparkToro, optimizing your forms is key. Um, so drawing on our own research into form performance after having helped customers collect over 2.9 billion responses in the last 10 years, here are some best practices to help you get started and to collect the zero party data that you need. The first tip would be to use multiple choice questions. First off, multiple choice questions are pretty intuitive. I'm sure almost everyone knows how to answer multiple choice questions because you've answered them in school, in life, what have you. Um, but secondly, by limiting respondents' options, they also yield data that's easy to analyze and you can extract valuable insights more efficiently than if it's just an open text um, field and you have to do a lot of analysis, which I can personally attest to much, much easier with multiple choice questions. Um, we also see that according to research from HubSpot, shorter surveys tend to yield higher completion rates. So you should aim to keep your forms concise and focus with uh, the most impactful questions that you can have. The data shows that 42% of customers are willing to answer seven to 10 survey question, but this drops significantly for longer surveys. So, um, there's other ways to optimize your form performance. You can use logic to make sure the respondents see the most relevant question for them and still keep it short. And you can also utilize our question by question insights to look at drop off rates and what questions and identify what questions you could tweak or remove to boost completion rate. Um, we also see that offering lead magnets such as discounts, giveaways, or free trials can incentivize respondents to complete your forms and surveys. Research shows that lead magnets can increase completion rates by nearly 5% in 
as they provide a sort of value exchange and tangible benefits for the respondent. I'm more likely to give you my email if I think that I'm going to get something in return. For example, uh, some stats about my industry or uh, a demo. And another thing that we see from the data is that looks matter. <laughs> we see that forums that feature images or videos experience a remarkable increase in completion rates of up to 121%, which is a huge number. Um, compared to forms that have no visuals at all. So it just seems like a bit of a no brainer to go the extra step and make your forms more visually interesting for better results. And that's something that we believe in a lot here at Typeform. And speaking of visuals, uh, branding your forms with your company's logos, colors, fonts, and media elements can help build recognition of your brand and help your audience like build a stronger connection with it. It also helps to reinforce brand identity, credibility, and making respondents more likely to engage with and trust your forms if they know that it's from you. And finally, we here at Typeform know that collecting data is just the first step. So the real value lies in what you do with that data and the customer context you now have. So our final tip is to connect your forms to your favorite apps to unlock the full potential of zero party data. Uh, by seamlessly connecting your forms to your CRM or your email marketing platform or your other tools of choice, you can build automated, integrated workflows so that the zero-party data you've collected can fuel personalized customer experiences at scale. <clears throat> For example, if you send out a feedback form uh, if, and you collect customer feedback, if you have uh, someone answering with negative feedback, you can automate a follow-up email to ask them how they are or to dig into that a little bit deeper. Or for example, if you have a lead capture form and you have a really hot, high intent, high priority lead coming in, you can trigger a Slack notification that goes to a salesperson to pick up that lead as fast as they can. Um, so you can work more efficiently and more effectively by connecting your, your forms to your favorite apps. And those are the best practices that we have for you. And now we'll open the floor to some questions. Uh, I think we'll have a look in the Q&A. Yeah, I can jump in and answer, I think, Martin's question first, which is the zero party data is focused in owned media, <clears throat> things like our websites, our emails, what have you. But how can we use it to attract new audiences? This is a great question. Um, and kind of exactly what we're facing with the cookie list future, where attracting new audiences was much easier with third party cookies and advertising platforms. So the zero party data specifically without talking about the way in which it's captured can be used to understand your current audience, people who are currently visiting your website or currently a customer to slowly over time, whether it's via true progressive profiling or just asking questions about why they're there, what they're interested in, who they are, you can build your almost ad hoc lookalike audience that you can then feed to advertising platforms like LinkedIn Campaign Manager, Google Ads, what have you. Whereas historically, you can use things like third-party cookies, <clears throat> track site visitors, and then use third-party data to understand who they are. Now you have to do that with this zero-party data. So it's going to be seemingly a little more manual, but it will become kind of the name of the game moving forward. So you're kind of using that zero-party data to understand who currently buys from you and then building a lookalike audience within those platforms to then reach those new audiences that look like the people that are already, shop already shopping from you. And on the flip side of that, that's using zero party data to build an audience to reach, to reach that new audience. You can also in current campaigns, typically most paid media, which is kind of what's most at risk for this cook of this future has landing pages. We tend to use forms, typically type, always type forms, on our landing pages so we can capture information at that moment someone has clicked and showed interest on whether it's contact information or why they're visiting or if they have feedback on the content or the ad. Um, so that's kind of the back end of how you can use zero party data when you're talking to new audiences already. Great. Um, I also see around questions around drop-off rates for surveys. So there's a few different ways that you can try to do this. And I think you have to sometimes touch a few different levers. 
So as mentioned, uh, try to keep your surveys like shorter and more concise and try to ask the most impactful questions, maybe by showing them the relevant questions through logic. Um, you can also uh, look at the analytics uh, behind a form to see um, drop off rates, which you can do in type form and see where the majority of respondents are dropping off. Then you can choose to either change that question or maybe take it out and optimize for that. Um, and I would say, oops, sorry, that's uh, how I would start there. <laughs> Okay. Um, there's other questions around best practices around, uh, sorry, I'm just going to take a sip of water. Best practices around embedding forms in our websites. I think it really depends on the type of form that you want to have. Um, so with uh, website embeds, you can either do like a full page or you could just have it in, in a frame that's um, contextual in your website or have a few different pop-ups, which you can program different like behavioral triggers. For example, if someone has scrolled 25% uh, of your page, the form can pop up or if someone's about to leave the page, the form can pop up. So um, it depends on the use case. If it's a contact form, I would just have it probably maybe static at the bottom of the page, but if you're looking for um, feedback or uh, wanting to collect key customer information, maybe as a pop-up, um, I would experiment with the different embeds to see what drives uh, the better results. Um. Kevin, I think there's a question for you around, you said that cookies and data should not be confused. How would you differentiate cookies and data? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I see it from Michael. Um, there's a much bigger technical answer that I probably wouldn't have time to explain, but the data is just the information you collect on someone. The cookie is the means by which you can collect it. A cookie is literally a string of HTML that attaches to your browser. So it's a very kind of technical, um, piece of software, if you will. So the the reason they're confused is because we're using words like first party, second party, third party for both things, but they are separate. So the data is just the information you collect, but the cookies, for example, a third party cookie that's tracking what you're browsing and what you're buying. The, the data is third party data because it's like, oh, this person, Nina likes shoes because she went there. She didn't tell them that she likes shoes, but because she browsed that, the assumption is that's that's the information she has rather than her providing it. So there's a slight difference, but they are related, which is why we had to speak to both of them. No, thanks for that clarity here. Um, okay. Another question. Imagine a landing page with multiple pictures of products. What could it look like to solicit microfeedbacks besides each beside each product? Not a pop-up that takes over the screen, but a mini form next to each picture. At the end, the visitor can enter their email to submit thoughts. Um, I think that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of friction in that experience. Um, yeah, I think one of the I mean, one of the main differentiators and kind of proof points of Typeform is that we do the one question at a time. So there's plenty of people that use Typeform, use Typeforms and are only asking one question. Now, the technical aspect of actually embedding that form next to each product on a product catalog page, um, that's, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about how to do that, but I think it's a great idea. It's almost like a version of progressive profiling where you're asking someone questions over time. So you're not overwhelm overwhelming them with a million questions at once, but if you're looking for just feedback on that product and you understand who that person is, then you're kind of building a profile of that person all with zero party data. So I think it's actually a great idea and something we should probably pass to our own product team to see if we can do something. <laughs> for sure. Um, I think right now you could probably simulate that by just having a type form and having the different, so one question, one image of the product, and then a question for that product. Um, but yeah, it would be in that one question at a time form experience. So thank you for that idea. We'll pass that to our product team. Yeah, um, someone, someone asked um, 
Is it 100% certain that third-party cookies will be phased out in 2024? Google has said so, but they've also said so in previous years and then delayed that many times. So I don't think anyone has 100% certainty. There's also other browsers out there. <laughs> That's another trend actually that is part of the cookie list future is that browsers like DuckDuckGo and Brave are entirely cookie list and those are gaining more popularity. But people tend to look at what Google is doing as it relates to cookie list, the cookie list future. And they have said that they're going to ramp up the 1% to 100% by the end of the year. So I'd say it's pretty safe bet, but we can't say with absolute certainty. Um, and then the second part is, will that mean in practice that all cookie banners will eventually become completely redundant and disappear? Not necessarily because going back to one of the first slides, there's first party and third party cookies. Sometimes, you know, there's varying laws and things you have to say in the cookie banner, depending on what country or state you're in. But sometimes you can actually read more information about the cookies and accept and decline certain ones. So I think first party cookies, the ones that are used to Kind of make sure you're still logged in and like I said, keeping your cart full if you're shopping and then step away. Those cookies are less likely to be at risk or and you still probably have to accept those. It's third party cookies that we're for the most part talking about here. Amazing. I also see a popular question. Is this fully customized and optimized for GDPR? I'm in Norway and it's a huge deal in Europe. Yes, uh, at Typeform, all of our customers' data is processed complying with the GDPR framework, no matter uh, what country it belongs to. And you can read more about it at our uh, at our help center. And we also have a security page that goes into detail um, for that. But long story short, we are uh, GDPR compliant. Um, so from Gloria, it says, what do you think about putting a form before being able to book a demo? Is that too much of a barrier for customers? We, we want only enterprise customers to get to that demo and filter small users and redirect them to self-service. What would you recommend? This is actually a similar practice to what we do and what I would say most B2B customer companies that do have demos are doing. So yes, I'd say it's a great practice, keep it as short as possible, ask the bare minimum of questions that you need to understand to actually score and qualify that person as enterprise. And we have some of that features, some of those features and functionality in our product to score um, and conditional logic. So if they're answering the questions correctly and they're that ideal enterprise customer you want to book to a demo, you can branch the logic to make sure that at the very end you send them a Calendly link or whatever you need for them to book the demo. And if they don't answer or reach a certain kind of threshold of scoring that you want, you can kind of migrate them to the self-service side. And I think some of the information Liz shared here, I know she shared a couple of articles would cover that, but we can find one that's more specific. Great, that sounds good. Um, I see, Martin, you have asked a few times whether we're going to be able to track third-party data server side after they remove third-party cookies. Um, I think I'm not technical enough to answer this question. I don't know if you are, Kevin. No, and I saw two related to this. I think, I don't know if you could elaborate on the question a bit, but you're wondering, like, the DSP on the advertising side can serve forms to collect zero party data, almost like embedding them in the ad units themselves. If, if that's the question, um, then I think it's a big TBD. I think that would be ideal. We tend to, when we're serving ads, like I said, put them on our landing pages so we can kind of collect zero party data, even if it's not current customers, but getting kind of those new broader audiences at the top of the funnel to reach our forms, but actually embedding them in those ad units, currently not a capability of ours and typically and I, again, this could be off the mark of what you're asking, but typically the platforms by which you are running ads on have their own native ones. They're a much different, more basic experience. Like you've seen forms on LinkedIn and, and YouTube even, but yeah, so today not, not part of Typeform. Great. Thanks for jumping in there. Um, so Uh, in our experience, how much of the answers provided are fake? Um, there's always a few um, options. Uh, there's always a few answers that will come in that are um, inauthentic or fake, but we're currently working on a uh, protection for that against spam and also bot attacks. So look out for that on the roadmap in Typeform.
Um, I also see a question, what about AI chatbot versus forms? I think it's a really interesting question and um, one that we're currently asking ourselves here in Typeform. I think it really depends on the different use cases that you want. For example, forms, you have a little bit more control than gives you a structured experience. Chatbot, it can be good for different use cases such as um, customer support or maybe education use cases where you're trying to give a lot of information. Um, but of course, uh, we're continuing to investigate that and see uh, how we can develop in this direction as well. Um, I see that we have a question about community. So we have a type form community, which is a forum and we share a lot of interesting resources there. So we'll be sharing this uh, recording and all of the slides in the community as well. You can access it via typeform.com um, and uh, you'll be able to access everything there. Great. Um, for the question about the Chrome pop-up, we might have to follow up um, yeah. our product team. It's a little more technical. Yes, we'll follow up with our um, product team and we can also put it in the community post. Um, and the question about what's the best way to connect the zero party data with loyalty plans? I mean, during the process of the customer experience. I'm. Not 100% sure what you're asking here, but if it's how to, uh, I mean, you can, for example, have a loyalty program uh, that you deploy forms or use forms to collect information for the people who want to register in that loyalty plan, and then that will be zero party data there. So by having that form, by um, collecting registration and collecting the contact information that you need that will be connecting zero party data to that. On the question on, do I have to adjust my cookie banner if I embed type on my website? Is type from tracking something or uses cookies? I think we'll also have to follow up on that with our product team. Um, and any examples of how Typeform has used been used to gamify a website experience uh, in a membership context. So I will say that Typeform customers are super, super creative. And we have seen examples in the wild of people creating games uh, uh, or stories and um, with complicated logic uh, to, to gamify experiences. So this is definitely possible. We don't have a example at hand right now, unfortunately, but um, I can say that it's possible. <laughs> cool. Are there any more questions? As I said, some of the more technical questions, we're going to have to follow up with our product team and we can get back to you. Great. Well, If there are no more questions, I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure having each and every one of you here as we explore the intricacies of navigating the cookie list feature together. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to emphasize that your feedback is super important to us and we want to provide content that's not only informative, but also tailored to your needs and interests. So if you could spare a moment to share your thoughts on today's webinar uh, and what you'd like to see covered in future sessions, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, we're dropping a form in the chat where you can leave your feedback. And for those of you who may have missed parts of today's webinar or simply want to revisit the insights we shared, worry not. You're going to find the link to access these materials in the chat momentarily, and we'll also send it to you in a follow-up email. Um, so keep an eye on your inbox. We'll also be sharing the recording and additional resources on the Typeform community where you can post any follow-up questions you might have. And I just want to say our journey doesn't have to end here. So we want to make sure that we provide you with ongoing support and resources to help you stay ahead in the ever-changing world of marketing. So if you want to dive deeper into the topics that we talked about today, 
we invite you to download um, the data on data report that we recently put up uh, to subscribe to our monthly marketing newsletter, uh, Informed, or to check out the Typeform blog for more articles on zero party data and more. And if you enjoy today, be sure to stay tuned for upcoming workshops and webinars. Um, once again, thank you all so much for being a part of today's webinar and for your questions. It was great to chat with you all, and we look forward to seeing you again at future events. Until next time, thank you and take care. Thank you all.